Hello, my fellow kin. Welcome back to the channel and welcome to another unit analysis video. In today's episode, we'll be taking a look at everyone's favorite dedicated transport, the only dedicated transport, the Sagittar. As always, we'll be taking a look at what they actually are. We'll learn how to best equip them, how to best use them, discuss some stratagems and combos, and wrap the video up with some very important considerations for when you decide and you will decide to include this unit in your army. But before we go any further, I want to remind you all that we now have a dedicated Discord server for the channel where you can join free of charge and interact with a growing community of like-minded Voltan players, talk tactics, share photos, and even get your models featured in my weekly videos. As we see here with this beautifully painted Sagittar and company painted by one of our Discord members, Kag. So if you want to join in on the fun, don't forget to join our server using the link in the description below. So what are Sagittars? Well, like I said, they're our dedicated transport unit and the only one we have access to at the moment. They're very fast, they have pretty good damage output, and they're fairly economical, meaning that for what you get, it's pretty cheap. Looking at the data sheet, we see that they have movement 12 with a 6-inch scout, their toughness 10, 3 plus save, 9 wounds, leadership 7, and OC 3. So very solid profile baked in here. We also have the ability to conduct an advanced move with this vehicle and still disembark whatever cargo is inside. There's also a very handy ability that is not actually listed on this data sheet, but it is listed on the Hearthkin Warriors. And what it allows you to do is when you embark Hearthkin Warriors into the Sagittar, you are allowed to split the unit. So combat squad them in half and keep five inside and five somewhere else, which is really, really powerful. But we'll talk about that more in a second when we look at who can actually ride inside of this vehicle. In terms of weapon options, you have three primary choices. You have a high lies, which is more of a swingy weapon. You have the missile launcher, which is a bit more consistent and comes with a secondary gun being the L7. So you get a Sagittar missile and an L7 missile. You also get access to a third choice being the matter cannon. I forgot this was a choice, I'll be honest with you. I figured I'd make this video because it'd be the fastest for me to put together, only comparing two profiles. And then I opened it up and saw that there was a third weapon choice, which we never see. But we'll talk about it anyway. The matter cannon, which is here for infantry. And all of this, with a very solid profile, comes in at 115 points. Now, it is worth mentioning that because it's a dedicated transport, this means it must start the game with something inside. So you have to pay a tax to have this in your list. You need to start something inside of it. So if you're building a list around these, the points cost technically goes up a little bit because you have to factor in that something needs to start the game deployed inside of this dedicated transport. So in terms of transport eligibility, who's cool enough to actually ride in this dune buggy? The capacity is six infantry. That is the limitation. It cannot be something in an exosuit. It cannot be something in the bulky Terminator armor. You're left with only five choices. You could run Berserks. You could run Grimnir. You could run a Cal. You could split your warriors like I just mentioned and put them inside so five would go in. Or you could put an Iron Master with his little robots. Now it's also worth mentioning that the companions you see with some of these characters being the robots or the Grimnir's flying guys do count as taking up a spot in this transport, which kind of sucks because that means if you wanted to, for example, run a Grimnir with the Warriors, you can't actually fit them all inside of the transport because now you would be at a transport capacity of eight, which exceeds the limit. So in theory, if you wanted to have a character lead a unit inside of this, it would have to be a Cal with five of the Warriors, but we don't really see that commonly done. Just something to keep in mind. However, this does mean that our cargo is quite flexible. We have several options available to us depending on what purpose we actually need the Sagittar to fulfill and what we plan on including in our list. And this is where things get a little bit more technical because it is slightly dependent on the archetype that you are running with your list. And we'll talk a little bit about archetypes towards the end of the video, but I do plan on making a full video on this subject in the near future. So the big question now, how should you run them? What should you equip them with? Like I said, you have three primary choices. You have the high last beam cannon, which is sustained hits D3, 24 inch range, two attacks, BS4, strength 12, minus three AP, D6 damage. So casino gun, basically. You have a chance to get extra hits and you have a chance to do a lot of damage. It has a very high ceiling and a very low floor. 
The second choice, which is the most comparable to this, is the Sagittar missile launcher, which comes with an L7 missile launcher. So this is going to be a little bit confusing as we're talking here because they're both missile launchers, but they are both part of the same equipment loadout selection. So if you choose one, you get the other. And I put some arrows here just as a visualization to help you understand. You get both of these guns together when you choose this weapon option. And so the Sagittar missile launcher is 36 inch range, two attacks, BS4 plus, strength 12, minus three, three damage. So a more conservative, but slightly more stable output than what we would see with the high last, but very comparable. In terms of the L7 component, we have two options. We have a blast mode and we have a focus mode. The blast mode is very underwhelming, but it's 24 inches, D6 attacks, BS4, strength four, zero AP, one damage. When we look at the L7's focus blast, which is Probably a little bit more interesting for us. It's 24 inches, one attack, BS4, strike nine, minus two D6. So it's sort of like a slightly weaker last cannon, but it comes with the Sagittar missile launcher for free. So it's pretty cool. Our last option is the Matter Auto Cannon. And this is really designed to be more of an anti-infantry killing weapon. And we see it as 24 inch range, six attacks, BS4 plus, strike seven, minus one AP, two damage. So the question now becomes, well, what should we run? Is it always worth taking a high las? Is it ever worthwhile running the anti-infantry? Well, let's math this out and find out. Let's kick things off with range scenario 1A being the high las beam cannon. So for those of you who are familiar with my formats, this is where I walk you through the setup as to how we get to the table that has all the numbers inside. In an effort to speed these videos up, we're going to just look at the math behind the scenes for this one weapon profile. And then for all the rest of the guns, I will not show you this and just jump straight into the table, but at least you'll understand where the numbers came from without having to actually go through each and every single one. We're always going to run the same assumptions for this entire video, and it's going to be that there are two judgment tokens on your target because it's just way easier like that, and that everything else is bare bones, meaning that there is no impact from stratagems, no impact from data sheets, reducing or having damage, and we're also not counting things like cover. So this is really just shooting this weapon into an enemy profile, into another set of stats. Now for this profile, we see that we have a base of two attacks coming in, so you can see that with the 2A. This will generate us about 1.33 hits on average when we consider that we're going to be hitting on threes because of a judgment token. Now, out of those two base attacks that are firing, we have a 0.33% chance of getting sustained hits. And from those sustained hits, we have a 0.66 extra number of shots that would be generated from that because it's D3. This takes the total amount of hits, if we add these together, to be about two successful hits on average. For the next part, I simply take the total amount of hits that went through and compare them against the different toughness brackets we see here on the screen that would impact the wound roll or successful number of wounds that we inflict based on this weapon profile. And so I ran those against something less than toughness 12, which generates 1.67 successful wounds. I ran it against something that's T12 for 1.33 successful wounds on average. And if we shoot this gun into something that is greater than toughness 12, we get on average one successful wound roll that goes through. And of course, the last step is to run these numbers against the different save characteristics that these profiles have at the different toughness brackets. And what we get is a table that looks like this. And so here we see there are rows of toughnesses corresponding to different save characteristics. So a two plus base save, for example, for column one. And then we have the numbers in black, which represent the total amount of unsaved wounds that go through. So whenever we shoot, these are the saving throws that our opponent fails. And then the color underneath, which is actually colored, is simply the amount of unsaved wounds that are going through multiplied by the damage characteristic of the weapon. In this case, it's D6, which averages out to 3.5 damage. So I simply multiply 3.5 times whatever number in black is above it. And then I get the purple number, which is the total amount of raw damage that goes through. You don't really need to care about this, it's just so you know, and it's going to be a little bit easier for you to follow along when there's all these numbers on the screen. At least you get an idea as to where these numbers came from and how I'm coming to these conclusions. Now, very surface level here, nothing too crazy. If we look at the table, we see that the most amount of damage comes through when we're shooting at something that is less than toughness 12, and something that is T12 with a three plus base save. We're not looking at invulnerable saves for now, so this is just base saves without invulns and against realistic target profiles. So what I mean by that is at toughness 12 with a three plus base save, we get 3.88 damage. And if we look to the right, we see we get 4.66 at toughness 12, four plus base save. 
but this isn't really a realistic target. There aren't any targets in the game that are toughness 12 with a 4 plus native save. So in this case, I factored in just realistic targets and it looks like this is where we get the most amount of damage if we shoot at something with the high last profile. We see a similar pattern emerge when we look at things with invulnerable saves, being the most amount of damage at again less than toughness 12 because it's easier for us to connect our shots and at toughness 12 exact with a 5 plus plus or 6 plus plus save because we get a little bit more value, a little bit more punch with our AP here. Again, nothing too crazy, just very surface level. So if we want to plug in an example, let's look at the Gladiator Lancer. We have it at toughness 12 with a 3 plus base save. This puts us in the section that is highlighted in green. So we would get on average 1.39 unsaved wounds that go through as something that is toughness 10, so it's less than T12, and a 3 plus base save, resulting in, when we multiply that by the average of a D6 dice being 3.5, 4.87 damage on average if we shot one Hylaz into a Gladiator Lancer. So this doesn't tell us all that much on its own, but let's see what happens if we compare the Hylaz output to the other comparable selection being the Sagittar Missile with the L7 combination. And again, I put on the screen here the Sagittar Missile Launcher stats for you to look at, and we're running the exact same assumptions that I mentioned before. Taking those numbers and running them against the different toughness profiles and save characteristics results in a table that looks like this. Now before we go any further, you'll recall that the two weapon profiles are basically identical in all but their damage output and range. So when we consider that, talking strictly through averages, the high last D6 equals about 3.5 damage. Which means that in every instance, if we look at strictly averages, the damage of this profile will be objectively higher than that of the missile launcher. So the high lies will always come out on top when we look strictly at averages. And that's exactly what we see when we put the two profiles side by side. At the top, the high lies in purple is always better than the Sagittar missile launcher, which is in red. However, this is misleading for two reasons. The first reason, which is a little minor, but it's that the L7 profile has a second gun option, that little LAS cannon one, that's available to fire. So what happens if we combine both of these shots into the same target? Will we get more damage in this case? And the second consideration, which is the most misleading one, is that we're not taking into account the statistical variability of the profiles, which is the biggest reason why you would consider taking something that objectively, on average, does less damage. So we'll look at these two misleading considerations one at a time. Our first consideration is simple enough. In order to determine how much extra damage we get with the L7 option combined, I simply conducted the exact same calculations using the other profile. In this case, I elected to compare the damage of the anti-tank option because I felt like it's a little bit more comparable and of course, firing the blast mode would be absolutely negligible into these tougher targets. So we're gonna look at the damage of the L7 missile launcher focused mode, which I put here on the screen, and we'll simply add that number of the raw damage output onto the damage profile of the Sagittar missile launcher and see if the combined damage of these two weapon options is higher than that of the high lies. So running the numbers generates a table that looks like this, and the damage actually looks pretty low. And I attribute this to the fact that it's only one single shot that's going out. So because of that, there are several instances where this one single shot simply might not connect. And then when it does connect, it's a variable damage characteristic of D6, meaning that it averages to 3.5. And when we multiply 3.5 by such a low chance of getting an unsaved wound going through against your target, we end up with very low damage. So this is why the numbers are significantly lower than what we might expect to see here. Now for the purposes of our analysis, and for the whole reason we're conducting this experiment, we want to take this damage and add it on to the damage output of the Sagittar missile launcher component. Now, we only really care about a couple of profiles here. We're looking for something that is less than toughness 12 and things that are T12 or beyond. And for the first part, T12 and beyond is pretty easy. We simply look at the bottom row of things that are greater than toughness 9, because no matter what toughness we are shooting at, as long as it is greater than toughness 9, which is anything T12 and above, naturally, we can simply take this damage and it should on average always be the same, because everything T9 and above is included here. And what we see looking at this bottom row is that we get, if we shot into the same target, about 0.59 to 0.98 extra damage on average into something that's toughness 12 and higher. So it's really not that impactful. But what happens if we want to look at the damage output for something that is less than toughness 12? Now this gets a little bit trickier because 
the data for something less than toughness 12 is unfortunately for me baked into all three of these roles. Anything less than toughness 9, anything that is T9, and things that are above toughness 9 up until T12 are going to be below toughness 12. So this means I have to get the numbers from each of these roles in order to get an idea as to how much extra damage we get when we shoot at something less than toughness 12. So what I elected to do in this instance was simply average the damage from each column of save characteristics in order to generalize the increase we can expect to see across each save characteristic for something less than toughness 12. And so what I did, I took each column, I took the numbers in yellow, I added them together, and I divided them by three to get the average of that column. And so what we get are the green numbers here listed below. For column one, something that is less than toughness 12 with a two plus base save, on average, we'll get 0.78 extra damage that goes through, and so on and so forth for the rest of the table. But what does this actually mean for us in terms of damage output? Well, here we see the above output for the original Sagittar missile launcher that's in red versus the bottom chart showcasing the same damage that you see above with the inclusion of the damage we calculated for the focused fire mode added into it. So I grayed out the unsaved wounds because the only thing I affected here with the math was the actual damage output. So simply put, I added the values we just calculated for the damage output of the focused fire mode L7 onto the Sagittar missile launcher damage that we calculated before and that you can also see on top in red as a reference. So I just put these numbers together and we get slightly more damage now and we can compare this to the high highlights and see which one comes out on top. And what we get when we compare our combined L7 and Sagittar missile to the high highlights profile is the following. It looks like universally we still get more damage on average with the high highlights firing but the damage is slightly more comparable in several instances and a little bit closer. Let's look at a couple real examples to help contextualize this. The first example we'll look at is going to be using the Gladiator Lancer. So this is less than toughness 12 because it's T10 with a three plus base save. And I highlighted these in the squares that you see on your screen. And so what we get is the high las on average will do 4.87 damage that goes through. Whereas the combination of an L7 missile and Sagittar missile together shooting both at the Gladiator will give us 3.81 damage on average. And so pretty close, but we're about one damage off on average if we were to compare these two weapons. So what about something with an invulnerable save? If we were to look at a Konofki Doomstalker that sits at toughness eight with a four plus plus, we see that the high last does only 2.92 damage on average, and the L7 and Sagittar missile combination will get us 2.45, so significantly closer in terms of the gap here. So what does this all mean so far? Well, putting it into words, the high las does more damage on average than the missile launcher across the board. However, there are two important considerations we have to keep in mind. The first one, which we just looked at, is that the Sagittar missile launcher comes with an extra gun, being the L7 missile. And in this case, the high las still does more damage on average. But it's worth mentioning that because you have two different guns, by including the Sagittar profile, you can actually split fire a little bit better, if that's something that you were considering. Now, let's look at our second consideration, which is variability. And this is going to be the biggest determinant as to whether you're running a high las or the missile launcher. I think the easiest way I can illustrate the variability difference to you is by putting the two profiles side by side, being the high las and the Sagittar missile, which is the one in red. Now, I blocked off the colored numbers, being the damage output, and the only thing I want you to focus on are the numbers in black. And again, these numbers are the total amount of unsaved wounds that go through. So the failed saves your opponent makes. To no one's surprise, we see just as we've seen this entire video so far, is that the high last has more unsaved wounds that go through. And as we saw before, more damage. But is that actually the case? Let's look at a realistic example. Say I want to shoot my missile launcher into a toughness 10 3 plus save target. I know I can expect on average 0.92 unsaved wounds to go through, which in real life means I can expect my opponent to fail about one saving throw, which means one of my shots will connect. The damage profile on this weapon is flat three. In this case, I can be extremely confident that if I shoot this target, I should get three damage in. So what about the high highlights? Same target, toughness 10, three plus base save. We get 1.39 unsaved wounds. In this case on the table, I could be very confident that one shot will go through and connect. But how much damage will this actually do? It says 4.87 on average, but this isn't actually the case. We don't know. 
when we consider the variability of the gun, the high losses damage is anywhere from one to six. There is an equal chance for any one of these numbers on the dice roll for damage. With the missile launcher, we know that on average it's flat three. So the high loss, while it has more unsaved wounds that go through, the damage is sporadic. It has a floor of one and a ceiling of six. It could fall between any one of these numbers and the damage that is averaged in purple that we saw before is unrepresentative of what actually might happen because an average is only an average when we consider that there are a lot of shots being fired, a lot of dice rolls being made. If we are just rolling one dice, there is an equal chance for any one of these digits to come out, one to six. But if we have many of these dice, in this case, many Sagittars that are firing, then the average becomes a little bit more reliable. Putting all this math together, in conclusion, the high laz is a way more swingy gun. You either miss all your damage or you absolutely nuke it. You have literally between one and 30 damage that could come through with a single high laz gun. That is how variable this is between its floor and ceiling range. If everything goes through, you get three extra hits, they all connect and you roll sixes on everything, you're looking at 30 damage flat that goes through with this thing. It's unlikely, but it's possible. And you're also equally possible to get just one damage through if everything makes it in, because you roll just one on your d6. On the other hand, we have the missile launcher. It's more predictable, it's more stable and consistent. It's three damage flat, it's reliable. It has longer range, and we know that it gives us access to a single strength nine D6 shot, which helps compensate a little bit of variability and a little bit of fun in that. So there is still the possibility of getting a little spike of damage, but it is much less risky than running a high loss. We also know that because of variability and because of how averages work, the more high last guns you bring, the more you approach the average damage characteristic and therefore attain more stable and consistent damage throughout the course of the game. Now, all that said, for the first time in all of these unit analysis videos, there's actually no right or wrong choice here. It really comes down to things as simple as your list design, the number of Sagittars you plan on taking, and what your risk tolerance is. Do you prefer to have the potential of doing up to 30 damage with a single gun, or would you rather be able to predictably account for three damage iterations of shots and know that you'll be able to safely pick up a target on the table with certainty? We cover two of the biggest gun options on this weapon, but if you recall at the beginning of the video, I said there was a third choice, one that eluded me as well because I forgot it existed, and this is the Matter Infantry Cannon. Now, is this thing actually usable? Now, how does it fare when we compare it to the other options we just examined? I put the stats on the screen again for you at 6 attacks, BS4, strength 7, minus 1 AP, 2 damage, and we're running the exact same assumptions of 2 judgment tokens and bare bones. Running those numbers against the different target profiles and the different save characteristics generates a table that looks like this. And again, very surface level, super general, but it looks like the most amount of damage we get with this weapon is if we shoot at something that is toughness 7 or less and that has between a 3 plus and 6 plus base save. We have a nice spread of values here ranging from as low as 2.67 to as high as 6.67 instead. So we do do a decent amount of damage to light infantry targets. It's very similar when we look at invulnerable saves and no one's surprised. It again tends to do the best when we're shooting at something that is less than toughness seven or T7, no matter what invul save they're at, we'll get roughly the same amount of damage that goes through here. And I think again, this is just weighted because we have more shots going through in general with this gun. And so there's a higher chance that your opponent fails some of their saves. Now, unfortunately with that said, it looks like the number of shots that go through in a lot of cases simply aren't enough damage to actually outperform any of our other weapon options we looked at, namely the high loss for a first example. So I put the two profiles side by side here, and I'd like to look at a couple examples into targets that we would assume this gun might actually do better against. Looking at the first example here, we have the Humble Intercessor, and we see that the Matter Cannon, a weapon which is probably ideal on paper for this unit, still falls behind on average to the high loss in terms of damage output. Given that these guys are two wounds, both cases will have some spillover damage here. 
You do get slightly more unsaved wounds, however, with the Matter Cannon, which means you could get closer to two unsaved wounds on your opponent. In this case, the Matter Cannon would pick up one extra model. So if you had to choose between the two to kill your Intercessors, and you want to pick up one extra Intercessor, you go with the Matter Auto Cannon. But what about something that has a solid and vulnerable save? Something that, if we were to shoot both at, maybe the weight of dice has more of an impact. And what we see if we look at our Canoptic Doomstalker, we do see that there's slightly more unsaved wounds that go through with the Matter Cannon because of the high number of shots as we predicted, but the two damages fall so flat to the average of 3.5 we see with the high laws. Now it is worth mentioning again that because of variability we might actually just roll a 1 for the damage, in which case, funny enough, the Matter Cannon would actually come out ahead. Though I do think that the 16% chance of that happening is low enough that I wouldn't really consider taking the Matter Cannon over a Hylas to shoot at a tough target. However, there is one area where the Matter Cannon would actually outperform the Hylas pretty consistently, and that's predominantly into single wound models, so models with one wound, where the total amount of unsaved wounds simply equals one dead model. So the number in black is the number of dead models because they're all one wound. In those instances, like what we see here, for example, the Matter Cannon will get more damage through because we don't care about the actual damage characteristic and raw damage going through of the weapon profile. We just need one damage to connect to pick up a model. Another notable instance where the Matter Cannon outperforms the High Laws is for targets that are less than or equal to Toughness 7 with an invulnerable save. Here we can see, in some cases, double the amount of unsaved wounds. So if you wanted to shoot at some cultists with a base invulnerable save, you'll probably pick up an extra model with the Matter Cannon. What this all means is that the High Laws has more raw damage on average than the Matter Cannon, without a doubt. However, the Matter Cannon does generate more unsaved wounds, and as a result of that, you do get marginally improved damage against one wound models. So how about the Matter Cannon into the Missile Launcher? And what we see here is a relatively equal and consistent expectation, where there are more unsaved wounds for the Matter Cannon, which again checks out when we compare it to our previous example. In this case, we do get more value, albeit extremely slightly, into one wound models. We do, however, see a pretty interesting discrepancy between the two guns, and that is that something that is greater than Toughness 7 with a 5++. plus plus. In this case, we actually get more damage with the Matter Auto Cannon, regardless of whether we're shooting at something that's Toughness 10, Toughness 12, or even beyond that. So I'm inclined to believe that because it's only 3 damage flat with this weapon profile, the amount of shots we get with the Matter Cannon at 2 damage does help to outweigh the amount of saves that your opponent might take with that involved. So you get more of that go through, resulting in more damage, because the discrepancy is only 3 to 2. I do think this is actually pretty interesting because if you consider that things that are probably going to be around toughness 10, toughness 12, having a 3 plus base save, you would actually have a 5 plus plus interrupt the AP from the missile launcher on the Sagittar. But with the Matter Cannon, you actually will still get damage that goes through. And it looks like the damage is still higher than what we would expect with the Sagittar missile launcher. So weirdly, very weirdly, the Matter Auto Cannon actually does more damage into a high toughness target if they have a 5 plus plus invulnerable save. Although, although, keep in mind, it's very marginal and it's nothing crazy. In most cases, it's barely one extra damage that goes through. We also weirdly see that for targets that have invulnerable saves in general, the Matter Cannon actually comes out on top, which is super weird because you'll get a little bit more damage into something like an Optic Doomstalker, where you would expect to see the Sagittar Missile Launcher actually take the lead here. Again, it's really, really marginal. It's by about 0.33 damage, so don't necessarily think you need to take a Matter Auto Cannon to outperform the uh, anti-tank shooting of the Sagittar Missile Launcher, but it's still very interesting to see that there are some very specific areas where the weight of fire from the Matter Auto Cannon Cannon when you're shooting at something with invulnerable saves actually just outperforms the damage that you would see using the Sagittar missile launcher. We see this trend continue for things that are greater than toughness 12, so anything that's toughness 13 in the game. We see that the damage is actually matched with the Matter Auto Cannon when we consider something with a 2 plus base save at 1.33 raw damage, and it's even exceeded when we look at something with a 3 plus base save going up to 2 damage compared to the Sagittar Missile Launcher at 1.66. Now, for me, the part that's the craziest to see is that even for something that's Toughness 12, 
the damage difference between the matter cannon and the Sagittar missile launcher really aren't all that different, which is absolutely crazy to think about. So in general, we have a very similar situation as we see with the Hylas, except that the matter is better for one wound targets, it's slightly worse at toughness 12, but it's also slightly better at toughness 13, and generally, we can expect to do a little bit more damage, but very, very marginal for things that have good invulnerable saves. Now very quickly, just for fun, I threw in the blast profile mode for the L7 missile launcher just to see if this has any impact when compared to the matter auto cannon. And what we see is that the matter cannon is universally better across the board in terms of unsaved wounds and in terms of damage that goes through. However, it's worth mentioning that if we were to take the damage of this blast mode and we add it onto the damage characteristic of the Sagittar missile launcher, as we did when we first compared it to the Hylas, we do see that the damage characteristics and unsaved wounds for the missile and L7 dual combo come significantly closer or even above in some instances to that of the matter cannon, as we can see on the screen with this one example I highlighted. Ultimately, I really won't spend too much time on this because the differences are absolutely marginal and we have enough data to infer a conclusion. But just keep that in mind that because you're firing both guns together, you could actually get a little bit more damage that goes through compared to the matter autocannon. We looked at a lot of data, a lot of math, and a lot of numbers. We looked at a lot of different profiles as well. So what does this all mean together? Well, for my range loadout conclusion, we can conclude that the matter cannon is slightly better into one wound targets, it's slightly better into toughness 13 targets, or invulns against the L7 specifically, but if we consider the context of the army and the larger game as a whole, I really think it's wasted potential to include a matter cannon when you have the L7 and Hylas available to choose from. Think about what other armies are running, think about what your own army runs. You have enough means of dealing with anti-infantry or anti-elite, so much so that the marginal damage difference of 0 0.03 to 0 0.09 extra damage is wasted. It's just ineffective. You are wasting the potential of firing effectively into toughness 10 targets or toughness 10 targets and beyond and doing a ceiling of potentially 30 damage with a single high last shot. I think that this is a platform that gives you the opportunity to swing and I really think that sacrificing that ceiling or that play into toughness 10 beyond targets for the ability to have marginal damage increase into very niche T13 targets or things with incredible invulnerable saves or picking up an extra intercessor model or chaos cultist is just wasted. It is wasted potential. So the choice between the Hylas and the L7 for me is where it's really at. They both have merit and they both have play and they both see a lot of play if you watch any of my other videos where we look at some of the top competitive lists. The high lies is significantly higher in terms of ceiling and it is way more variable. There is a lot of randomness with this gun, but we could help reduce or control some of that variance and variability by including multiple units with this weapon profile. The L7 conversely is significantly more flexible and predictable. By flexible, I mean you have the inclusion of a secondary gun that has two different firing modes, you're able to split fire more effectively as well, and we know that the damage is stable, it is predictable, and we can expect to calculate three damage if we connect one of our unsaved wounds. On top of that, it's also safer because of a longer range, and we get more consistency with fewer units included in the list. In conclusion, I would strongly recommend that you avoid taking the matter cannon because it is so easy for you to get access to similar weapons across the army as a whole, and it is not that impactful in the current meta game. When it comes down to the Hylas and the L7, it really is based on your own risk tolerance and the list composition or archetype that you decide to run your Leagues of Voltan as. In my personal opinion, I think so long as you include some other anti-tank platform in your army, just take the high lies. I really think the high lies ceiling of 30 damage is where it's at. It just feels like a waste to take anything else when you have so much potential with one single model that's 115 points. With the math out of the way, let's have some fun and talk about how to use these Sagittars effectively, some stratagems and combos, and end the video with those important considerations to keep in mind. I mentioned the term archetype several times in this video, and predominantly you'll see 
two core methods of including sagittors in your list. You can either be running a mechanized archetype where in this case, we'll see a large amount of sagittors being run. And we're including sagittors here because we want these to be the core of the army. We're running upwards of six sagittors in a list like this, and we're trying to load them up as cheaply as possible. You'll typically see people running a lot of Grimnirs or a lot of characters just because they want to throw something into the sagittor so it doesn't blow up at the start of the game, and you get six of them on the table to run around and do shenanigans and just do a lot of damage with their high las cannons. The other option you'll typically see is that the Sagittar will play more of a support role. So it's going to be here to transport things that maybe you need to get to a certain area of the table, like warriors who are going to be doing some secondaries for you, or even berserk squads in some instances where you're going to stage them in the middle. And in these cases, you'll take around two to four Sagittars. Now notice that you're always going to be taking some. There are no lists that do not take any of them because they play such a pivotal role in list design. They help you split your warriors, you get more bodies on the table, you get to more places quicker because the army is exceptionally slow when you consider our infantry's movement. In the case where you're running these as a support unit, you're still going to see a mix of guns taken on them, ranging between all high lives or all missiles, or in some cases, a mix of the two. Ultimately here, you're trying to load them a little more purposefully because they're going to be helping your other units do something rather than the Sagittors being the bulk of your list and the bulk damage dealer. Because of that, the Sagittars play not only the role of damage dealers, but they also help to threaten primary by killing whatever's on it, getting onto the objective very quickly and staying there, being toughness 10 and 9 wounds. They could apply early pressure through their scout moves, they could run across the flanks pretty easily because their movement speed 12, and they also act ultimately as an anti-tank platform. If your opponent tries to poke something out, hopefully you get an angle on them, and when it's your activation, you can fire a couple high lies into them and probably pick up the target. A common question I see asked is how to do proper deployment with this army. And this is a video I want to cover in the future, but for now, I want to show you a quick overhead example of how I would run three Sagittars in my list. So as you can see, I have the green deployment zone highlighted for you on the screen, and we're using GW Terrain Layout 3 of the Leviathan Match Play Rulebook. Now what you can see is that using three Sagittars, I've deployed them up to the line, and in many cases, they are out in the open. This is intentional. I fully understand that from my opponent's deployment zone, as you can see in red, they are very likely to get angles and pick these Sagittars up if they get turn one. However, by deploying your Sagittars as aggressively as possible on the line in different areas of the table, you're able to do several things. The first one is take advantage of your scout move. This means if you go second and your opponent's going first, all you do is simply pull your Sagittars back and hide them somewhere safe behind ruins. In this case, you're staging for your return fire, for your return activation, or your turn one. So you'll get to move out safely because you know where your opponent is at and you don't need to worry about them attacking you first turn and losing a model because you deployed so aggressively. Now the main reason to deploy so offensively and aggressively at the start is because we know that it's safe for us to do so. But we're also priming ourselves in case we draw a secondary objective that requires us to be somewhere on the table. Our goal is to try to be in a position turn one where no matter what card we draw, nine out of 10 times, we'll be able to score it. You can see in this example here on the screen, I have the potential turn one to get either something in the center, be in three out of four table quarters, or get my cargo out onto a table corner edge, ready to score any of the attainable turn one secondaries I draw, like investigate signals, extend battle line, area denial, tempting target, or engage on all fronts. I am ready. No matter what I draw, I have a plan in place and I have a unit there that is able to score that for me, securing a very early lead, which is critical to the strength of the army. Now, in terms of strategy and support, there really aren't too many choices available for our Sagittars. I'd say the biggest one is Ordered Retreat. So this allows you to fall back, shoot, and charge. It's pretty helpful. You could use it to get onto an objective, maybe if you want to fall back and then charge something else. But more importantly, it gets you out of combat and allows you to shoot at either that target that you were just in combat with without penalty or shoot into something else, maybe in the middle of the table or something that's on another primary objective. So a pretty good strategy for only one CP. 
Another viable option here is Void Armor. I think Void Armor is probably better suited for something like your Hecaton Land Fortress, but keep in mind it does stack with cover, so your 3 plus base save in theory could go to a 1 up, which is pretty nice. I would generally say don't use this on your Sagittar unless you really need to stay somewhere. It is dependent on your survival of the vehicle in order to score a point or just hold or contest an objective, then I think it's probably a good use to pop Void Armor on it. But because it's only 115 points and you're probably going to have at least two to four of these in your list, it doesn't really matter all that much if your opponent focuses fire on this and ignores something else. I will of course give an honorable mention to Tank Shock, which is the universal stratagem, and this allows you to play bumper cars with your vehicle. So you get to charge something, and you can pick up some extra wounds on the target by ramming into it and rolling those d6 to fish for mortal wounds. So you get a little bit more value out of charging to help incentivize maybe some movement shenanigans or some better staging opportunities if you have something inside of your vehicle, like the Berserks who are going to come out and then fight whatever's next to them, or if you're trying to go for a primary and kill whatever remaining couple of models are sitting on the objective. Now to wrap the video up, I want to quickly mention a few considerations to keep in mind for when you decide to run this unit. And I joked at the beginning of the video that you will run this unit, and I hope you understand now why it is critical to include at least a couple of these in your list. They are so fast, they are so cost effective, they're spammable, and they are exceptionally viable. They have an incredible data sheet card, they have an incredible ability to punch up, with their insane randomness and variable shots, and they're very flexible to fit whatever need or role you need them to take in your list. I would say that the most important thing about these is mastering your deployment and knowing how to take advantage of that scout move early on to apply pressure or to set yourself up for success in the game and be able to get a very early lead on secondaries. You also want to consider what kind of archetype or goal your list has in mind. What is their cargo? What is the design and purpose of your list? Why are you running Sagittars? What do you need them to do on the table? The last consideration is consider that based on your loadouts, you're going to have different target priorities, a different activation sequencing, in other words. If you are running, let's say, three Sagittars, and two of them have the Hylas, and one of them has the Missile Launcher instead, I think it'd be better for you to open up with running the variable shots into one target first, and then if there are a few wounds left over, you try to pick it up with three wound guaranteed missile launcher. So by doing so, you're not wasting the three damage shot and then gambling even further by hoping you get to pick up enough damage with your high lies to kill the target. In this case, you open up with your high lies, you get it as low as possible, and then with your stable three damage shot, you assess your needs and you assess whether you have the potential to kill the target or not, and if you're guaranteed to do so with that three damage output. All in all, the Sagittar is an incredible unit to have for Leagues of Voltan. It is absolutely critical to the success of any good Leagues of Voltan list and just getting our army in a state where it's able to actually move around the table. I absolutely love the models. I love how they look. I love how they play. And there's nothing more fun and sometimes frustrating, of course, than rolling your high last beam shot and just one-shotting any tank on the table. If you enjoyed this kind of content, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Leave me a comment down below. I'm curious to see what you think about the Sagittar, how you run it, what your preferred loadout choice is. Don't forget to also drop by our Discord channel. We have a quickly growing community of like-minded Voltan players who engage in all sorts of hobby, tactics, and video content related discussion. As always, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll catch you all in the next one.